so we have uh, Sophia Sheikh going to talk about the nine axes of merit for techno signatures. Sophia is a grad student at Penn State. Um, and uh, yeah, go ahead, Sophia. All right, thank you. Uh, so today I'm going to talk about something that was kind of originally put together at the Houston workshop a couple years ago. And in this particular talk, I'm kind of steering that idea towards thinking about uh, non-radio and in this case, non-communication technosignatures. So to start out, I want to give credit where credit is due and say that the nine axes were entirely a community effort. Um, the ideas that kind of created this framework have been around in the literature a long time and in the more recent literature as well. And there were many, many people who kind of, I had conversations with at the Houston workshop and put things up on slides and uh, all of this contributed to the creation of the nine axes of merit. So uh, figures of merit are kind of something that we think about in astronomy generally, but especially in SETI, they've been pretty common on the radio side. Um, and here, when I say figure of merit, I kind of mean a general sense of a way to determine which studies are the most efficient, which ones are going to make the most progress, uh, and which are the most scientifically important. So kind of the obvious uh, kind of logistical link that you can get here is towards funding. How do we make sure that we have a nice diverse strategy and that we're pursuing all of the things that are going to make uh, the most progress in the field or have the best chance of succeeding? So in Radio SETI, there's been a lot of thought um, over the decades to how to quantify these ideas. Um, so in the bottom corner here, I have a recent figure of merit from Enriquez et al. 2017 as part of the Breakthrough Listen Project, which this stands for uh, Continuous Wave Transmitter Figure of Merit. So if you have a radio transmitter that's on all the time, how do you quantify how your search compares to other proposed searches? And this one uh, kind of compares between, okay, how many stars are you looking at? What bandwidth are you covering in your search? And what are the powers of the things you're sensitive to? But that's just one formulation. So that's nice and quantitative. You can plug in numbers and say, our search ranks here compared to other previous searches and other proposed searches. Um, but you could also prioritize, instead of these particular variables, you could prioritize survey speed. You could prioritize uh, any number of things that you think are more important to how to quantify the merit of your search. Um, so these are great. They're necessary for radio study um, and they're very important, but this kind of quantitative formulaic approach doesn't transfer more generally to the kind of techno signatures we're thinking about in this conference which span many instruments, many wavelengths, uh, and many different approaches where you don't always know some of these variables. So uh, that was kind of the impetus for creating the nine axes. Um, and one nice thing about the framework is it encompasses many styles of merit. So we kind of included all the variables that we could think of that apply to any kind of techno signature search that you could propose. Uh, and we ended up with nine in the end. And the nine axes were built to be broadly applicable. And here uh, I'm going to steal Brian Lackey's definition of broad. Um, so in the bottom corner here, you see this plot. And Brian Lackey has talked about kind of constructing SETI searches to think about breadth versus count versus depth. Uh, and this is in a very recent paper that came out, I think about a month ago at this point. Uh, so the, uh, let's start with depth. The depth of a search is how deeply, how long do you look at a certain target? Um, so depth can be, we looked at this one target with all wavelengths. It could be, we looked at this target for a very, very long time, but it's saying, we think this one object is particularly interesting for some reason, and we're going to spend a ton of resources on that single object. For SETI, this doesn't make too much sense yet because we don't have single objects uh, in general that kind of warrant that level of investigation. So 
in that case, you can kind of fall back on the strategy that the communities used in the past, which is to prioritize count. So say that you have a class of objects that you think are more interesting for some reason, look at as many objects in that class as you can. So for example, uh, maybe G and K stars. You think these sun-like stars are more likely to have intelligent or technological life, and you look at as many of those in that category as you can. The third axis is breadth, and this is where the nine axes are very helpful. If you don't know at all what you're looking for, then you want to make sure you look at at least one example of any class of object you could think of, because you don't have any reason to prioritize one over another. Uh, you kind of have a uniform prior. So, at least for now, uh, we might want to prioritize breadth in our searches, and that's kind of what conferences like this are doing. We're trying to think of as many different approaches as possible and apply them all at the same time. Uh, and that's why it's useful to have a way to compare the relative uh, strengths and disadvantages of all of these different styles of search. So I'm going to jump right into three case studies to show kind of how to apply these axes of merit. Uh, so the first one is something that was brought up in the previous talk, which is the idea of a Dyson sphere or Dyson swarm. And when you're doing these characterizations, you sort of have to pick a specific method. You pick your techno signature, you pick your method by which you're going to search for it. So here I'm going to think about specifically waste heat from Dyson spheres. So as far as our observing capability, how, uh, how capable are we on Earth of performing this search? We have infrared telescopes that would allow us to look for waste heat from Dyson spheres. So the search can be done now. That's good. Uh, and as the GHAT survey showed, you can do searches like this with archival data. So that means the search is relatively cheap. Anytime you don't have to build a new instrument or don't have to take new data, that's great. Um, also, there are many things in the universe that in, emit in the infrared, and those are astronomically interesting objects. So even if you search for waste heat from Dyson spheres and you don't find any, you have still performed a novel scientific search that's going to give interesting scientific results. So the search has ancillary benefits um, that will be useful to the broader scientific community. Uh, and that's especially helpful um, when you're proposing technosignature projects to be able to articulate these are the other kinds of science that can be done with these observations or this project. Um, detectability is a little bit of a squishier axis because it's of course linked to things like observing capability. But in general, we're looking for a big effect here uh, as far as actual length scales go. We're looking for something the size of an entire stellar system. So that puts this more towards the detectable side. It's a large impact on its environment. Uh, another benefit of waste heat searches is that Dyson spheres are longer lived than perhaps electromagnetic beacons because you don't have to continually input energy into them uh, and they could outlive their host ETI uh, or their um, constructors. So that kind of leads it more towards the long-lived side of duration. Uh, and I'll jump down here to inevitability. This is another axis that you can argue about a lot, and there are a lot of interesting discussions that you can have about this axis. But energy collection is one of the few things that all the life we know of on Earth does. It uses energy in some way. So perhaps scaling that up even to something like a Dyson sphere would be pretty inevitable and pretty generalizable at least based on what we know from Earth. Um, of course, you do have to build an entire stellar-sized construction, and that's not nothing. Um, but also looking for waste heat in particular is a more inevitable technosignature, because as far as we know, the laws of thermodynamics tell you you have to have waste heat if, you're, if you build something this large that's collecting energy from its star. You can't really get around that, and so that adds kind of more inevitability. Um, and then if we look down here, the things that this doesn't score very well in, if you want to think of it that way, uh, the signature from a Dyson sphere looks very similar to infrared signatures 
from dust. Um, so if you find a bunch of objects in your Dyson sphere search, most of them are just going to be dust or dusty regions of space. Um, it also, of course, requires very high extrapolation from the current technology we have on Earth. And if you do find a signature from a Dyson sphere, it will not tell you very much about the ETI that built it uh, because you're getting a black body curve. It can't send you information in ones and zeros. You don't get that kind of bit stream that you might get from an electromagnetic beacon. So I want to move on so I don't take too much time here. So uh, the second case study I wanted to think about, because it's something we'll be talking a lot about this week, is atmospheric pollution. So here specifically looking for spectral signatures from some technologically produced gas in the atmosphere of an exoplanet. So I kind of optimistically said that observing capability is pretty good. It's something that we're just on the edge of being able to do with telescopes like JWST or in the future, Habex, Louvoir, Origins. Uh, but it's pretty resource intensive. If you actually want to uh, be able to see these spectral signatures, you're going to have to use a lot of integration time. And that might be a hard sell for a lot of the astronomical community. But uh, these are observations that we want to take for other astrophysics anyway. We're curious about the atmospheres of terrestrial exoplanets. We want to characterize them. We want to look for biosignatures. We want to understand geological processes. So these are uh, searches that are probably going to be done anyway. Uh, and if you want, you can kind of adjust those sliders to say, well, the cost is cheap if you wait for someone else to take the data. Um, as far as detectability goes, like I said, it's kind of on the edge of our capabilities right now. Um, but if you want to kind of pump up the amount of these gases in the atmosphere, you can make it detectable by, say, JWST for a handful of nearby exoplanets. Um, duration, though, is a bit of a problem for these because you need something that's going to remain in your atmosphere in steady state for a long period of time. And that's tricky uh, with a kind of dynamic, dynamic atmospheric environment. Um, then again, depending on the gas that you choose, you might pick something that is entirely unambiguous and we don't know any natural process that would produce it. Um, so it has that advantage over say Dyson sphere searches. Uh, these searches don't require much extrapolation from what we do on Earth. Um, for better or for worse, we are changing the atmosphere of our planet. And we could imagine a, an ETI that does so at five times the level we're doing or 10 times the level we're doing. And it's not that far off from our current capabilities if we decided that was something we wanted to do. Um, inevitability, again, is one of those axes you can argue a lot about. Is it inevitable that an ETI would produce atmospheric pollutants as a byproduct of whatever they're doing? Perhaps, that's the way it worked on Earth, um, but that's something I think needs more investigation. And again, as far as information goes, this is relatively information poor because you can't send an intentional signal with your spectral uh, kind of signature of pollutants. Um, you would be able to tell well, there's this gas, which can't be produced naturally. Maybe we could get the concentration or relative concentrations. Maybe we could see those and observe them over time to see how they change. Um, but that's kind of the limit of the information that you can get from this technique. And finally, I want to talk about one that you might not have heard about, because uh, as far as I can tell, there hasn't been much work on this subject yet. And it's something I'm kind of working on on the side right now. Um, gravitational waves as a communication method have been discussed in SETI, and most of the studies have found that sending gravitational waves is extremely energy intensive for not that much benefit, so it seems like a strange choice. Uh, however, I'm interested in gravitational waves that are produced as a byproduct of something else that you are doing. Um, so, of course, I've chosen the Enterprise because I had the chance to put it the Enterprise on one of my slides. Uh, but thinking about moving large masses linearly through the galaxy, 
Um, so you would get a signature that's very different in gravitational waves than your typical maybe uh, binary in spiral signature, which has some period to it. So uh, we have instruments that can detect gravitational waves and they're kind of finding these in spirals pretty regularly now. So the search can be done now. And if you wanted to look in archival data to see if you found any of these linearly accelerating signatures, it would be pretty cheap. Uh, you are purposefully looking in a part of parameter space that is empty. So not many ancillary benefits if you don't find anything. Uh, and at least as I've found so far, which you'll see some of on the next slide, this would probably be pretty low as far as detectability goes. Uh, when you accelerate something, very little of that energy goes into gravitational wave production until you get to very highly relativistic speeds. Um, these signatures would be extremely short-lived because they would only be visible for the duration of the acceleration, and you've got C as your upper limit there. Uh, but they would be extremely unambiguous because there's nothing we know of in our galaxy that can just continuously accelerate linearly. <laughs> uh, this requires high extrapolation from current technology because it requires you to accelerate what seems to be the order of a solar mass to get anything even a little detectable, uh, which is not something we have the capability of doing right now. And again, it's pretty information poor, which you'll notice is kind of a theme with these non-communication techno signatures. And as far as inevitability goes, I've kind of put it more towards the contrived side, because again, why do you want to move an entire stellar mass through the galaxy. Uh, that is a very specific scenario that I'm assuming. But at the same time, there's no directionality, which is nice. You don't have to be, say, in the beam, like gamma ray signatures from potential rockets. And you also don't uh, need to assume any reason for the mass to be moved. I don't need to know why the mass is being moved, but regardless, it's going to leave the signature. So, those are kind of three case studies. If anyone is more interested in this gravitational wave project, it's something that I'm working on right now and I was hoping to present for this conference, but alas, projects take longer than you think sometimes. Um, but I'm looking at characterizing the best case strains for linearly, eh, linearly accelerated masses versus the current detectability limits of instruments like LIGO or LISA. Um, and one thing I've discovered so far is that the fuel is just as important to the problem as the ship, because both of them are mass energy that are moving. Uh, and so far, I have been able to numerically calculate the luminosity curves for a solar mass ship accelerating at G. Um, and so here are those luminosity curves. The one that is relevant is the pink curve here, which is what you see from the ship and its fuel. Uh, if you had a ship that did not require any fuel to come out the back, or did not require any uh, beamed propulsion or anything, which I'm calling a magic ship here, then you would get a much higher uh, luminosity in gravitational waves. And this is because your fuel actually cancels out some of the signature from your ship. Um, so, Trying to approach this analytically did not work, so I'm in the process of kind of numerically going through calculating mass quadrupoles and uh, eventually trying to work out these strains that are the actual uh, detectable variable for our uh, detectors here on Earth. So with that, I'll wrap up. I'm happy to take any questions about any of the nine axes things, and I just wanted to plug the Slack channel that's in the TechnoClimb Slack Earth Detecting Earth. Uh, this is another project I would love to have some help with and collaboration on this week, um, which is thinking about at what distance Earth-like detectors can detect Earth-like technosignatures um, for a range of different technosignatures. So if anyone, if that sounds interesting to anyone, please come join us at that Slack channel, and I will hand it back over for uh, questions. Thank you.